one more month of uh, great best practices sharing, and this month we um, are very, very fortunate to have with us uh, Dr. Mike Dolan from Gunderson Healthcare, one of the consistently top performing uh, uh, health plans and medical groups in the country. Um, and uh, we couldn't be more appreciative of, of all of our supporters here today. Uh, I don't want to take the time to um, uh, name all the various groups that are very important here, but I should say that we have the major health plans, major medical groups, the community clinics, the patient advocates, um, and uh, many wonderful uh, supporters like the Heart Association here with us, uh, the California Chronic Care Coalition, the California Department of Public Health, um, and I just want to say that what this forum is really about, for anybody who's new, is to make sure that we're not, um, uh, when we talk about managed care in California, it's not managed care in name only, it's actually managing the care. And so we have with us today um, a, a really special um, uh, presenter who will go into his uh, details in a little bit, but for now, why don't we go around the room and Carla can uh, help you all to uh, introduce yourselves. I know a lot of people are, are running late, but I do want to call out uh, UC Davis in particular for uh, making an effort to, to be with us. Uh, Dr. Tom Balsba, thank you for, for joining us today. David. Hi, I'm David Eckling. I'm the medical director for Molina. Jessica Nunez de Gaga from the California Department of Public Health, Director of Coordination for our California Wellness Plan. <coughs> Don Hubbard, Chief Medical Officer, Western Health Advantage. I guess just enunciate really loudly because we're not sure if the mic is working. It's not loud up here. My name is Lynn Bagge. I'm an assistant physician chief for Kaiser Permanente. Thank you for being here. Hi, I'm Blair Barrett. I'm a clinical program manager with Blue Shield in our quality improvement department. Joan Wardman, I'm a retired UC nurse, and I am currently vice chair of the California Health Collaborative. Hi, I'm Steve Dermott from MediShare Environmental Health and Safety Services, which was originally formed as a hospital shared service organization. Hi, Liz Helms, California Chronic Care Coalition. Uh, Justin Avery, Vice President, U.S. Health Center. Uh, we specialize in uh, prevent, preventative medicine and preventive care. Elaine Lynn with the Scripture Future Medication Adherence Awareness Campaign. Hello, I'm Diane Littlefield with Sierra Health Foundation. Chad Vargas from Health Services Advisory Group. Leonard Fry, LWF Home Care, specializing in hospital readmissions for the chronically ill. I think this is dead. Dead. <laughs> Nancy England, Blue Shield. Uh, I'm an account program manager. Tom Baltzball, UC Davis, uh, Medical Director for our Patient Center Medical Home Efforts and Medical Director for Care Coordination. Bridget Levitch, I'm mm -hmm. the Director, Nursing Manager, actually, of Health Management and Education. Gordon Barnes, UC Berkeley School of Public Health, the Grace Presbyterian Church in Sacramento. Yeah, I think it's working. Deb Robertson, Regional Director for Full Physicians Medical Group, and here in the Sacramento. Sounds like it is. Roger Tao, I'm the pharmacist for health decisions. Uh, I'm Gil Simon, I'm the medical director and founder and chief shepherd for second of the Medicators. Hi, I'm Nick Smith, I'm the regional director with the Quality Systems Improvement Program for Medicine Heart and National Health Association. Jerry Chapman, California Chronic Care Coalition. Analyst for the Institute of Population Health Improvement. David Matsumura with Novanoris, my executive, and uh, work with Population Health Management. Dr. Welcher, Stroke Coordinator, Sutter Medical Center. 
from the University of Wisconsin, and uh, he trained at Gunderson, uh, and has been an internist there for a number of years, still seeing patients. Uh, he's been involved uh, with the quality management, the dyad management model at Gunderson for, since 2002 as a vice president, where they actually link the, the medical side with the, the management side to ensure that uh, uh, they have an integrated system. So he's the uh, uh, medical vice president over Team 4 and has a number of service lines under him, cardiology, cardiothoracic surgery, orthopedics, uh, podiatry, uh, audiology, ENT. So, um, and so we're going to hear about uh, how they have approached integrated models of delivery to ensure quality of care. Gunderson, just a little bit of background. Um, is named after a Norwegian crane, Dr. Adolf Gunderson, who came to La Crosse in 1893 uh, to join Dr. Christian Christensen. And they were actually very revolutionary. So in the early 1900s, as you might recall, medical education medical education was all over the map. This is right before the Flexner Report that revolutionized medical education in the United States. He actually, Dr. Gunderson, said, we need to control who's on our medical staff. And that case actually went to the Wisconsin Supreme Court was upheld so that quality physicians uh, could be assured to be on medical staff and those that weren't of the same quality would not be. So that actually set a precedent in the United States. So uh, it, uh, they merged, uh, the medical groups and the hospital system merged in the early 1990s to form Gunderson Lutheran and then uh, really became Gunderson uh, in, in the early 2000s. So there's about 30 communities that they serve. Uh, they have six hospitals. Uh, they have four nursing homes. They have air ambulance and ground ambulance services. They have about 700 physicians and about 5,500 employees. So they have a very integrated model of delivery right on the uh, east bank of the Mississippi River. So uh, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Dolan. down because he did a phenomenal job on the history part of Gunderson. Um, Gunderson is a um, very unique place um, and uh, has a very long rich tradition. I happen to be there at the 100th anniversary of when uh, Adolf Gunderson first came to La Crosse to set up his practice. And um, I think most of the stuff that he just told you was in the book that they wrote for that centennial anniversary of the Gunderson Clinic. So excellent job on doing your research. Um, I'm going to talk for about 45 minutes today, hopefully give you some time to ask me questions about what we do at Gunderson. Um, I want to thank Patty uh, for, and um, my vitals for inviting me here and my good friend Bob Trine who was the connection to bring, bring this about. Um, Gunderson has been uh, working very hard on quality, as has the entire state of Wisconsin for quite a while, and, and hopefully I can share a little bit of our journey with you. So, in addition to some other learning objectives that Patty might have in the handout, a couple of things that I really want you to, to come away with is how do you locate across Wisconsin on a map. Um, if you come away with that, then I was successful. And then the last thing 
when it gets back to these Norwegians, they're really particular about the E versus O. And so remember that Gunderson is spelled with an E at the end and not an O. So here's the map. That little star in the middle is La Crosse, Wisconsin, and as he said, it's on the east bank of the Mississippi River. Um, I get views like this every day, except the river is about five times wider than the American, I think the American River, right outside here. Um, all those little white dots around that red star are regional clinic sites for Gunderson. So we have about 50 regional clinic practices um, where we see patients in very small communities. We're surrounded by some pretty big metropolitan area, uh, areas, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Rochester, which happens to be the home of this little place called the Mayo Clinic, our number one competitor, uh, Madison, where the University of Wisconsin is located, and then Marshfield, which actually is Marshfield Clinic, which is another large health care system. Gunderson has um, four critical access hospitals as part of its system, as well as a main tertiary care hospital in La Crosse. And um, it is the western campus of the University of Wisconsin Medical School. School. So we get a lot of students there. Uh, Gunderson has its own health plan. I don't think I heard that mentioned. Um, and uh, we employ about 480 physicians and about 280 uh, physician extenders, nurse practitioners, PAs, etc. So now that you know where La Crosse is, um, this is why I was excited to come to California. So, um, this is an actual picture of the road to West Union, Iowa, which is our farthest regional site. Um, it's about two hours away from La Crosse. We send specialists there, and uh, this is one of the two lane roads that people have to travel to get there. So, it is not a nice place in the world. Um, those are telephone lines and electrical lines uh, way back when, when the, all of those wires were uh, on top of our, uh, up in the, above the ground. Interestingly, we send our specialists to a lot of our regional sites, and this is why we really move towards telemedicine. So, uh, because just as it's hard for our specialists to get there, it's also hard for patients to get to lacrosse to see the specialists. So, we have an extensive network of telemedicine where our specialists can see patients in these smaller communities without the risk of traveling these icy roads in the winter. So I'm going to tell you the story of a patient. Um, as uh, Alan mentioned, I am still a practicing intern. So about half my time is spent in clinical function and half of my time is spent in administrative function. Uh, I happen to be the chair of the Disease Management Committee, which uh, also is why I have pretty good insight into some of this uh, work that we've done. Um, but one week out of five, I spend a week on the inpatient teaching service at our church and care hospital working with the residents and the students. So in January, we took care of a, a woman who I'll call Jane. Jane was 68 years old and um, had a primary care physician who was not part of the Gunderson network of physicians. But we had access to her records. Um, she was seen on the 4th of December by her PCP for a pre-op visit prior to cataract surgery. It was the first visit that she had had in two years. Um, and her blood pressure at that time was 166 over 88. No mention of it, no action taken. One week later, she was seen by our anesthesia department the day of surgery. Blood pressure in the pre-op area was 170 over 73. Again. She had her surgery, no action taken. Four days later, she was seen by one of our clinicians, actually, for a second not prior to her second cataract surgery, and her blood pressure at that time was 150 over 80. Again, no mention of the blood pressure being out of range, and the patient was cleared for surgery, which she had a week later. And then three weeks, three weeks after that, she was admitted to my service with left-sided weakness, a left facial droop, and slurred speech. Here's her MRI scan, which was taken the day after her admission. And as you can see on the right side, she's got an internal capsule uh, CVA on the right side, um, which is pretty extensive. I can tell you that uh, when she first got to our institution, her blood pressure was 210 over 120. Um, she was allowed to have permissive hypertension for three days, and then we started to work that down. She came in on one drug, a single drug, hydrochlorothiazide. And um, at the time that she was discharged to a skilled nursing facility, 
she, her blood pressure was within target, 130s over 80, and she was on three drugs. Three drugs. She will never leave the nursing home. She is 68 years old. She is in the nursing home for the rest of her life. Um, but now her blood pressure is controlled. That's why this is important. That's why all of this work is important. You have to think about what individual patients go through if we don't do our job right. And that's what we really try to preach. So in 2012, the Commonwealth Fund published a, a uh, an, art, an article, it was a, basically a, um, a publication about the status of health care in the United States. And they looked at over 300 regional systems and wanted to know how do people perform in 43 indications spanning four dimensions of health, which included access, prevention and treatment, cost and potentially avoidable hospital stays, and health outcomes. And so they looked at that. I think there's a really key quote from this study that everyone should um, take to heart. Success at the local level will ultimately depend on community and providers aided by strong leadership, setting goals, and taking action to achieve them. So what did they find? Well, I have to, full disclosure, La Crosse was not number one in this publication. Um, we were number seven. So we did um, very well, but we were not at the top. As you can see, the Midwest in general does very well. Um, the lighter colors are good, the darker colors are bad. The Northeast fares pretty well, and then parts of the um, Southwest uh, do pretty well. Um, here's the top seven. St. Paul, Minnesota, Dubuque, Iowa, Rochester, Minnesota, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Appleton, Wisconsin, Santa Rosa, California, and La Crosse, Wisconsin. Six of those seven are within a three hour drive of my house. So here's what I think is going on. So if you, I played with this map and put it together myself. Each of these markers is an integrated physician-led healthcare system um, that is uh, pretty large. I mean, most of them have a minimum of about 300 to 400 physicians and another 200 or more of providers. The Mayo Clinic has 1,500 plus physicians and another 800 uh, physician extenders. So each of these uh, systems is very large, integrated, and physician-led. Uh, in Wisconsin, we have now put six to, well, I should admit it's now eight, large systems together into the, into the About Health Network, and that network their goal is to set themselves apart from the rest of the state by a 15% differential in cost and quality. And they're about, not, they're 9% right now, so they're two thirds of the way there almost. So there's a lot going on. I could, we could try and speculate what it is, but fortunately the Commonwealth um, uh, Fund actually did a study of Gunderson back in 2009 that looked at why these large systems do well. And they basically, in a previous study published a year earlier, they had talked about the six attributes of a high-performing healthcare delivery system. And I want you to look at that. Information continuity. So clinically relevant information is available to all providers at the, at the point of care and to patients through electronic health, health record system. Two, care coordination and transitions. We have an extensive care coordination program that was initially started through our health plan, but the providers were so bought into the concept that they demanded that it be extended to all insurers, uh, or to all patients, regardless of insurer. And so now we have approximately, um, uh, yeah, approximately a thousand patients in care management who are your sickest two to five percent. And some of the data that we published for the cost reduction is off the charts. Now, when, the, when Gunderson is not the insurer, that just costs us reimbursement. So um, that's a big, a big deal. System accountability. So somebody's accountable for the care of the patient. Peer review and teamwork for high value care, continuous innovation, and easy access to appropriate care. Again, that telemedicine aspect. So here's the model that we um, adhere to. Uh, this came out, I think, of the um, um, Call Institute. And essentially, uh, what it is is you need your community. Our, our mission is to um, 
keep our communities that we serve as healthy as possible. Um, you need the community to, to participate. So you need biking trails, you need <coughs> walking trails, you need um, adequate nutrition available to all members of the community. And then you need a health system. And that care that the health system provides has to be timely, has to be efficient, cost-effective, patient-centered, coordinated, and evidence-based and safe. Uh, finally, you need patients and families that are empowered. We need to have patients and families that buy into the fact that we're trying to keep them healthy. And then you need a team, a team that's there to take care of patients. And that's, uh, most of our systems have been designed with the team concept in mind. So that's the care model. Back in 2002, we started our first disease management program. And the first two disease states that we put in place were diabetes and congestive heart failure. Um, the, the model that we have used has remained absolutely consistent since its inception, which is we put together a design team that has a specialist clinician and a primary care clinician that lead the team. There's usually a pharmacist, a nurse, an MA, a scheduling specialist, and then educators or a care coordinator involved in that team. That team is responsible for determining what guidelines to use, putting the algorithms out so that they're available to the providers, providing or developing education for patients so that we can get all patients on the same footing, and then um, getting the education to the providers. So the, that design team, that clinician, those two clinicians that lead that, their job is to go out and teach every clinician in the dietitian system how to do it right. Um, we've used that model uh, from day one and we've continued with that over the last 13 years. Uh, we started with diabetes and congestive heart failure, but then very quick, quickly we added hypertension, asthma, chronic kidney disease. We were the first system in the state to put chronic kidney <coughs> disease in our disease management program and the state subsequently used our model for the rest of the state. And then in the last five years, we've added chronic pain, so narcotic use for six months or longer, uh, depression, vascular disease, and COPD. Nine disease states. Um, I will tell you our clinicians feel somewhat uh, under the thumb of being measured on just about everything because that represents a huge number of patients uh, for our system. Um, but it typically takes about 12 months from day one when we decide this is a disease state we're going to function or we're going to work on and focus on to when we go live uh, in with the system. So why do we do disease management? Well, these three guys are doing a, a walk for diabetes patients who've lost their legs. We do disease management because the evidence is out there that if we take care of patients the right way, the way that the evidence says we should, we can prevent things like amputations. We can pre prevent patients from ending up on hemodialysis, which is, last I checked, a very expensive proposition. And we can prevent people from losing their vision and not being able to participate in everyday function as they uh, should be able to. So the key with disease management is we're trying to prevent those complications. And we know the data says that that's doable. So here's our disease management um, website on our internal computer system. So we, we use Epic uh, um, for our uh, patient care, but we have our own internal computer system. And on that, we have a disease management tab that gives us um, a chance to put all of our education materials, both patient, family, and provider, all in one spot. So if a, patient, if a provider says, oh, you know, I need some education for a patient that has hypertension, they can go to this repository and it's right there. So our disease management repository has all of this information just a click away. Um, the other thing that we've done in the last year and a half is we turned on the EPIC radar dashboard. Has anyone seen the EPIC radar dashboard? So um, we went uh, live with EPIC ambulatory in 2011 and at first it was about an 18 month gap where we just really um, lost our ability to use an EMR for our uh, disease management because we had built our own EMR back in 1997. We had used that for essentially 14 years and then all of a sudden it was turned off. And so everything we had to do was now in a system that was brand new to everybody. In two, at the end of 2013, we turned on the radar dashboard and 
Um, I will tell you that this has just changed the way that I do disease management on a day-to-day -day basis. So um, what it is is we, we've got all of our nine disease states on the radar dashboard, and then all of our measures that we're tracking are on there. You've got four months uh, of uh, data historically, and then the last column on the right is your current month-to-date data. The data is refreshed every Sunday night. So on Monday morning, this morning, I can go on and go into Epic, and I can see where I'm at with all these measures. This is my data. This is not my data from today. It's from about six weeks ago. But you can see that for on the top uh, part, it's hypertension. And I'm currently at 79% for hypertension. Now, in our system, that's a yellow. Uh, our target for this year is 88%. That's what our target is. So if you meet target, you get a green uh, check mark. If you're at yellow, it's a circle. And if it's red, it's a red circle with an exclamation point. So it's color coded so that in one glance, I can see exactly how I'm doing on all nine disease states. And then it allows me the ability to focus on those areas where I'm struggling, where I'm not doing well. So if you look at diabetes, you know, I'm pretty much all yellow except I've got one green check mark and then the red mark, which to me is the, the area where I have to focus, which is diabetes control. So how many of your diabetics have a hemoglobin A1C under 8%? So I'm at 65%. Um, I, I, that's my area of focus right now. So for the last month, my MA and I have been working that list. The other beauty of the radar dashboard is you can click on that measure and underneath will be a, a, a link to the list of patients that are not at target. And I can print that list off and hand it to my MA. My MA can go, she gets my data as well. She can go in and she can click that button and print that list, and she can help me work that list. So we do that together. And um, it's been just a, an absolute uh, paradigm shift on how to manage your registry of patients. It's, uh, it's been remarkable. So here's uh, our vascular disease. We have uh, four measures for vascular disease. One is blood pressure control. One is um, aspirin use or antiplatelet agents. The next one is statin therapy active, and then tobacco-free status. The best predictor of future events is previous events. So your highest risk group for vascular events are your patients who've had a vascular event already. So in that group, we may not, this is a, this is a, screenshot that I'm actually proud of. Um, I'm, you know, 95, 96% of my patients have their blood pressure control who have had an event. 98% uh, are on an antiplatelet agent. And um, statin therapy, another 96%. So pretty good numbers uh, any way you slice it. Where do I have to work? I have to work on that 26% of people that are still smoking despite having had a vascular event. That's where I need to work. So the radar dashboard for me has become my <coughs> management tool of my patients that have chronic disease. So WCA, anyone heard of WCHQ, the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality? So in 2003, um, nine CEOs, seven of which were physicians, as well as some uh, CEOs of manufacturing companies in Wisconsin got together to talk about how they could push the quality bar for the city. And out of that was born the Wisconsin Collaborative for Healthcare Quality. What it is, is it's a membership group of volunte voluntary organizations that all agreed to publish their uh, organization-wide data on the WCHQ website. So rather than a bunch of people publishing their own data, Everyone gets together, agrees on the, the measures, agrees on the definitions, agrees on how they'll be measured, and then basically every quarter has to submit their data to WCHQ, which then publishes it, publishes it on a uh, website. You can, if you have your iPad, you can put, put in WCHQ, you can get to their website, and you can see their data. But the key, the key things are, people like to agree to several things in order for this to fly. One is, um, the, the guidelines need to be adopted by everybody and everyone needs to agree on which guidelines they're going to use. Two, everyone needs to agree, agree on what's going to be measured and what's going to be reported. Three, 
can't be used for marketing. So if we're better than our competitor in town, which is a Mayo Clinic site, we can't turn around and say, oh, you know what, we're the place to get diabetes care because we're better than they are. We're at 72% and they're at 58%. We can't do it that way. And the last thing is, is people need to share how they got to where they are. So um, every three to six months, WCHQ holds a meeting. All of the member groups send their representatives and then they basically have somebody who's at the top of some measure go over how they got there. Um, and that's where you learn, that's where you spread innovation to all of the organizations within the state. So in 2014, I think 2013, we had 36 member organizations that covered about 80% of the population in the state. Um, and if, if you go to their uh, website and you click on reports, you get all of these different reports available to you. Some of the reports are um, chronic disease measures, so diabetes, hypertension, chronic kidney disease, etc. And then some are just preventive care measures, so colorectal screening, mammogram, pap smears, etc. And when you click on those, you can see how organiz organizations are doing. So this is a screenshot of the colorectal cancer screening uh, site. So you have all these organizations that publicly report their data. Now, I put this, this particular group up there for a reason. Agnesian is the lowest performer in the entire state network. And they're at 61%. And their direct competitor, which is Aurora Healthcare, is at 82%. So where in the world would you get people who compete directly in a community for patients who sit down at the table of Agnesian can send their representatives to WCHQ and learn how a board does it and then take that back to their organization and try and duplicate it and get their numbers up. So that's the benefit of WCHQ. Here's a, a WCHQ all or none, and um, this is one that we've really worked hard on for the last year. I spent Thursday and Friday in Appleton trying to learn from ThetaCare, who is absolutely the best at getting the all or none. Prior to this fall, the all or none was two hemoglobin a one season a year, uh, blood pressure or a, a renal function study done, either microalbumin or creatinine. Um, and an LDL measured within the last 12 months. Um, and you can see that most people are in the 60% range. They care is at seven, some ridiculous number, 76, 78% of the time. All of their diabetic patients get all three measures done. Um, the LDL measure changed this fall. It, it was dropped and now um, it will be an outcome measure for uh, diabetics on staff. Um, so again, everybody gets together in the fall, reviews the guidelines to see what's changed, everybody buys in, and, um, and then everybody learns from the top performers. So, audience participation time. So, I want you to get your clicker and tell me, according to the CDC, in 2011-2012, what percentage of U.S. adults with hypertension are under good control? data for hypertension control. And as you can see back in 2005 when we started reporting hypertension control for the state of Wisconsin, um, about 62% approximately of the hypertensive patients in that registry were under good control. There were about, at that time, there were about 200,000 patients in that registry in the state of Wisconsin. And you can see what's happened over the last uh, 10 years. 
Uh, that control has uh, gone up to about 76, 78 percent approximately. Um, and the number of people in that registry have increased uh, by 50 percent. So it's now 300,000 patients. So even despite the fact that it's 100,000 more patients, there are actually fewer patients that are not controlled compared to 2005. And those, hundred, those essentially uh, 50,000 or 40,000 patients that are under good control that normally would not be under good control in the rest of the country, they're having fewer strokes, fewer heart attacks, fewer kidney failure, et cetera. So it's a pretty good story for hypertension control in the state of Wisconsin. So a little bit about... Do you have a, a graph that actually shows your age-adjusted per capita rate of stroke and, and cardiovascular events to go along with that? Because it would just it should be here in the opposite direction. I don't, but I'm having people like that because Hattie asked the same thing when she when we went through um, the slides prior to this, and I have people working on that because I think that would be a great story. I have U.S. statistics. And that would be interesting to look at, but I don't have Wisconsin specific mm -hmm. yet. Um, so we did have Kaiser present that information in October at our big summit, and it did show exactly what Dr. Ertl is saying is the inverse relationship. It should be. It should absolutely uh, mirror the increase in blood pressure control. So um, the Gunderson Management System. Uh, just, to, just going to touch on it briefly. Gunnarsson has physician leaders at every level. Um, we work very hard to develop our leaders, so we give them education and project management, uh, etc. We have a dyadic structure, which you heard about, where physician leaders are paired with administrative leaders at, at virtually every level, from the executive suite down to the individual clinic. You have a clinical manager and a regional medical director that work hand in hand. Um, we have uh, morning rounds from 8 to 9 for administrative folks to round in their departments, find out the barriers, et cetera. That's protective time. No meetings can be held during that time. Um, we use the A3 process for problem solving. Um, we have activity boards, which I'll show you an example of. Back up a little bit. You're just blasting through some really important stuff here. Physician <laughs> leaders at every level. Can you just give us more paragraphs on each bullet? Because you've actually got more time than you think you do. Okay. <laughs> I've got a lot of slides to get through and a lot of things to do. So, um, so physician leaders at every level. The CEO in our organization, by our bylaws, must be a physician. Uh, currently, that's Jeff Thompson. He is a neonatologist. He's been our CEO and my boss for the last 14 years. Um, physician development, we start with our learning community. So uh, the very first thing that people have the opportunity to do, um, usually within the first five years of joining the medical staff at Gunnison, is they can be invited to the learning community. The learning community is typically run by the CEO, and then with various input and, and guest lectures throughout the 18-month process. So every month, that group meets for two hours on a Monday morning, and they discuss, you know, it might be on finances, it might be on strategic planning, it might be on project management, and then they just do a, usually some type of a case review and then work through all the different things. It's a very didactic environment. Um, good participation. People actually give, are, have, are given reading assignments so that they're prepared for it. Um, the diet structure, so at the CEO level, the CEO and the COO, CEO is a physician, CEO is not a physician, and they are paired um, at the next level. The medical vice president, the administrative VP are paired at the service line or department level. You've got a department chair and administrative director. And then at the clinic level, you've got either a section chair, a medical, regional medical director, and a clinical manager. So all the way down. Um, the A3 process is just a problem solving tool. There are many out there, PDPD, uh, SAs. Um, we use A3. It's just something that um, we've taught people over the, over the years. I've never um, heard of A3. What is it? Um, you start with what the problem statement is, and then you figure out what the barriers are. You ask the five whys, and you just essentially work toward it. There, it requires a um, diagram of the process and how you're going to fix it. So there's a great textbook out there. It's a paperback. Uh, soft cover, it's excellent. Um, it's very simple, people like it because it's visual. Um, so you see in departments, they'll have A3s 
mounted on their wall that they've worked through. Um, our biggest language barrier is we have a huge Hmong community in the lacrosse area. So we have about 8 to 9 percent, 10 percent of our population is Hmong, half of which does not speak English. So we have interpreters on staff, uh, and that's really mostly in the lacrosse campus area. Um, about 7 to 8 percent of our population is uh, African American, and then after that it, it drops off to just less than one percent from most other uh, nationalities. Do you have breakdowns on you know, the different uh, <coughs> ethnic backgrounds and, for example, hypertension and heart disease? And so how well we do with each um, national you know, we I don't think we do that. <coughs> Our degree, I think, um, we, we've not done that. We could do that very easily. I think we could crunch that data, we just haven't done that. Mike, Michael, in my experience, capturing the ethnicity in the EMR is a really spotty adventure. It isn't done very well in most places. I don't know off the top of but I can tell you it's very hard to get that in most EMRs because almost always it's the job of the front desk to capture that and they don't. Yeah. It, it, so it's hit and miss. I mean, it's some, very it, it miss. depends on the clinic. I think if you have a, a good front desk person, you probably catch that pretty well, but I don't, I'm don't. i not sure how well we do overall, and I, I don't think we've looked at it by um, nationality or race. What, what is the pair mix? Pair mix is um, about uh, 30, 28 to 30% is um, insured by Gunderson Health Plan, uh, about, and that includes a Medicare Advantage plan. Uh, about 40% Medicaid or Medicare, about 8 to 10% Medicaid, and the rest, and a very small percent of uninsured, about 4 to 5%, and then the rest of private pay, commercial insurance. Uh, I just uh, want to make a comment that maybe in the future we should invite uh, Sergio Aguilar Baxiola from East <coughs> because you are correct. that's made in the organization in just about every area across the organization. Um, here's an activity board. It's actually literally right outside my office door. Um, and our five key strategies, quality, service, great place to work, cost of care, and growth. And that's um, updated weekly by the clinical manager. So we're going to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about hypertension here. I know that uh, um, we're going to learn more about some hypertension stuff. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, our strategy with hypertension. So um, another question for you to answer. Hypertension-related diseases account for what percentage of all deaths in the U.S. based on 2013 data? And while you're thinking about that, I'm going to point out that Gunderson is fourth in the nation for controlling blood pressure. So they have quite a bit to teach us. And that's on the back of your agenda, in case you want to look at that. 
uh, national contextual data. And that's our NC2A data that is submitted by the patients in, that are insured by the Gunderson Health Plan. So our internal data looks at every patient, irregardless of, uh, of insured, uh, but the NC2A data is our insured, self-insured population for Gunderson. So, it's pretty good. Let's see how you did. So the winner here is D, 38%. Um, not bad. Interestingly, I think the last time the correct answer got 25% as well. The correct answer is C, okay? 25%. And these are the disease states that I associate with hypertension. So hypertension and hypertension, uh, kidney, hypertensive kidney disease, ischemic heart disease, congestive heart failure, and cerebrovascular disease, which also included um, uh, or dangerous and rupture, et cetera, all other 75%. So not a trivial amount, considering that every year there are 2.6 million deaths. Not, not a trivial amount of people die of hypertensive-related uh, complications. Um, these are, this is the 2013 data for just one age group, and that's 25 to 64. So people who are literally and now that I'm, that I'm in that age group, literally in the prime of their life, um, and it's 120,000 people died of these disease, of hypertension-related diseases in 2013 in the prime of their life. That's a lot of people. And that's a lot of people. Coronary U.S. 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 Now, this is U.S. data. Do you and, have data for um, I do, actually but it's in my notebook. Here's hypertension deaths. So despite the fact that hypertension control has improved since 1999, hypertension deaths per 100,000 people actually increased during that time. I think that's a coding issue. I think that's people recognizing it and putting it on death certificates better than they did previously. But look at what happened to cerebrovascular deaths. Just the opposite. Cut in half during that same time period. I think that's... Um, Probably four key things. One, better blood pressure control. Two, better recognition of stroke where people can present and be managed uh, more acutely. Three, the use of uh, anticoagulants and atrial fibrillation. And four, um, management of patients with interventional techniques, so uh, thrombolysis, uh, et cetera. So I think there are lots of reasons why cerebrovascular deaths per 100,000 have dropped. Um, Blood pressure control, as we said earlier, 50%. So it's like flipping the coin. If a patient comes in, they've got hypertension, the odds of them getting their blood pressure under control is like flipping the coin. That's pretty unacceptable if you ask me. So part of it is convincing clinicians that they need to do something about their patients that have high blood pressure. So here's our data. Um, so you've seen the WCHQ data. Here's our individual this data. This is all comers, uh, end of year numbers from 2007 to 2014. You can see we started at about 61% in 2007. And every year there's been an increase, with some years really accelerating very rapidly, all the way up to 2014 end of year data at 80.4%. That's all patients in the Gunderson system, irregardless of insurer, with blood pressure at target. Um, it's so important for us that our logging screens, this is the first screen that comes up. And it tells us how we're doing as an organization with the things that we think are important. LET, the Leadership Evaluation Tool. Um, controlling high blood pressure. Um, it's one of our targets as an organization, and you can see our current number and then our target for this year. At the end of this year, we hope to be at 88%. Why 88% percent? Because that's where the best performer in the state is currently sitting, and we want to try and meet them or, or match them. So it's got you, you as an organization. You have to buy in that it's important, and then how you get that information across should match your commitment. So why is it important to control high blood pressure? Well, high blood pressure leads to strokes, heart attacks, kidney failure, and congestive heart failure. And the data is pretty overwhelming that if you control blood pressure, you can reduce the, uh, the incidence of a first stroke by 30%, the risk of congestive heart failure by 50%, the risk of an MI by 20%, 
and the incidence of end-stage renal disease, dialysis, and death by 38%. The data's out there. That's pretty solid data that's been around a long time. But which guideline to use? There's three guidelines currently out there. And unfortunately, they don't all say the same thing. So you've got the AHA ACC guidelines, which by the way, we follow. You've got the American Society of Hypertension's guidelines out there. And then in 2014, after a six year delay, the um, JNC-8 was published uh, to much fanfare and much uh, hand wringing because <coughs> it was the, the statement that for people over the age of 60, blood pressure could be relaxed to 150 over uh, 90. And that made a lot of people nervous, interestingly, including five of the members of the 18 people. The 18 people? Yeah, 18 people <coughs> on the panel that actually came out with the JNC 8 recommendation. So um, these five people published uh, this rebuttal one month later in the Annals of Internal Medicine saying that um, the blood pressure, the data for allowing blood pressure to escalate to 150 millimeters of mercury in patients over the age of 60 was. Um, inconclusive and that it should not be followed. Last month this study um, uh, was presented at a national meeting and this was uh, a study done by Miller Medical School out of Miami and Columbia University and what they did is they looked at patients uh, and I believe it was in New York City and they broke down risk of stroke based on less than 140 systolic uh, compared to 140 to 149 millimeters of uh, systolic blood pressure. What they found was if your blood pressure was 140 to 149 millimeters systolic, you had a 7% increase of a stroke over those that were less than 140. And in women, it was twice as, the risk was twice as high. So if, again, more evidence that says that maybe that 150 mark for people over the age of 60 is not really where we should be going. The good news, AHA and ACC and ASH are going to join forces and publish, hopefully later this year, publish blood pressure guidelines that hopefully most of the country will buy into. And my guess is they will not recommend a higher blood pressure. Our design team did not go along with JNC-8 and they kept our guidelines at um, 140 over 90 up to age 80. After age 80, you can go uh, uh, greater than 140 systolic. Um, so here's the number of hypertension related deaths per 100,000 people in Wisconsin compared to California from the 2013 statistics. So, uh, 7.4 people per 100,000 die of hypertension-related disease in Wisconsin uh, versus 12.3 in California. That's 2013 data. Um, that's a lot of people per 100,000. You have a lot bigger population than, than we do. So it, it means real consequences for a lot of people. So you might argue that well, maybe Wisconsin people are just healthier than uh, <laughs> not so much. So, uh, <laughs> so here's a, a, a map of obesity rates across the U.S. And the darker the, the dot, this is by county, the darker the dot, the higher percentage of obesity in that area. So if you look at this, this map, um, Wisconsin has one area that's in the lowest category, and that happens to be Dane County, where the University of Wisconsin is located, and 50,000 people in that area are college students. Um, the rest of the state is much darker, some pretty dark. And then look at California. The majority of the state's actually in the lowest category. So California, there's another map by state. Cali California is one of the few states that's still green. Um, so it's not obesity. Um, I think, could it be ice cream consumption? Well, Wisconsin lives out there. We, we, got, we definitely have patients that come in and when you talk to them about their dietary history, they have ice cream every night. They eat dinner and then they sit down in front of TV and they have a bowl of ice cream. It is like a ritual. Um, California is still green on that, although there's a pocket of California that's in the top 10. And I can't remember where, where it is, but... Um, this is smoking rate. So maybe Wisconsin or Californians smoke more. No, we got to be there too. Uh, 
I grew up, uh, my grandmother raised tobacco, so I worked in the tobacco field, topping the tobacco plant, harvesting tobacco, et cetera. Um, kind of interesting, I ended up a physician. Uh, but so if you look, California has some of the lowest rates of tobacco use in the country, so it's not that. So Wisconsin's not inherently healthier than California, it's just that I think as a state they do a really, really good job of managing hypertension. So clinicians come to work every day wanting to do the best possible thing they can for their patients. But these are some of the questions that our providers have. So how can I convince my patients to take medication for something that they can't even feel? That's hard. That's really hard. Um, which medicines do I choose from? There are over a hundred medicines out there to treat hypertension. And then, yeah, I've got my patient on three medicines, and now we're not, uh, they're still not at target. Um, so, next question. Which of the following should be followed to obtain a proper blood pressure measure? A, patient should be seated on the exam table comfortably with legs off the floor. B, bladder should be empty. C, one or two step method can be used. D, exercise 15 minutes before measurement, or E, A, B, and C are correct. So 38% said A, 38% said E, and 0% said D. <laughs> so, anyone know the correct answer? It's not the 38%. It's B. It's B. That is correct. So, how you check blood pressure can have a big impact on how well you're doing controlling hypertension. Because for us, the way we measure is we look at the last blood pressure reading in the chart. And so if it's not accurate, and it's off, and it's too high, then we've got a problem. So um, we've tried to standardize our entire process around the clinic visit. I, I saw a picture by a clinician from Data Care, which is out of Appleton, Wisconsin. And um, the picture was great because in my world, what I think about with patient care is the visit. I mean, it's, it's this big thing, and that's what I, my whole day revolves around is the visit with the patient. You know how big the visit is in the patient's world? It's less than 0.02% of their life. The rest of, you know, they, they have, that's two visits a year, less than 0.02% of their life. They have a whole world out there. They've got work, they've got their family, they've got bills to pay, etc. They've got a lot of other things to worry about besides that clinic visit. And the thing is, is that for me, it's my opportunity to have the biggest impact is that clinic visit when they're in front of me. So it starts with planning for that visit. So we plan all our lab testing for that visit ahead of time. So the patient's labs are on the chart. So then we sit down, we can review that. We plan what we're gonna do for that visit. We call it pre-visit planning and it's just part of our um, patient-centered medical home. We do a lot of pre-work with the patient ahead of time. It's done, 99% the of that's done by the MA, just reviewing the chart of all the disease management patients. Um, and then when they get there, it's scripted. We have everything pretty much planned out. So the patient comes 15 minutes early. They meet with the MA. They sit for five to 10 minutes while they review medications, um, review immunization, make sure those are up to date. Then they check the blood pressure after about five to 10 minutes. Patients have been instructed not to smoke. Uh, drink caffeine or exercise for at least 30 minutes before the visit. They're seated in a comfortable chair with a back, with their feet resting on the floor and their legs uncrossed, and their blood pressure is checked utilizing the two-step method. Our MAs went through a MA college, which was an all-day event to get them all trained to do this process standardized across the entire health system. And so every visit looks the same so that every blood pressure measure, measurement is taken the same way. We ingrain this in people's head that this is why we control blood pressure. So when we talk to the patient about starting medication for something they can't actually feel, my response is we are doing this to prevent strokes, heart attacks, and kidney failure. 
But you know the medicine's going to cost me money. But we're doing this to prevent strokes, heart attacks, and kidney failure. You can't say that enough to the patient. You just can't. Because they need to know why you're telling them to take something for a disease that they can't feel. So we really teach everybody, you need to know this phrase, you need to repeat it multiple, multiple times when you're dealing with patients. Because patients don't want to take medication. Um, medication is just one thing. Uh, there are other things that you can do. So, um, myth number one, lifestyle modification doesn't work. Lifestyle modification does work. But the trap that we fall into as clinicians, and, and I can tell you, I've done this so many times that uh, I ought to be, uh, have my license taken away, is we fall into the trap of letting the patient dictate what we're gonna do. So I talked to the patient about their blood pressure is 162 over uh, 96. And I say, you know, there are these lifestyle measures that you can do that will help to bring your blood pressure down. Okay, I'm gonna do that. Great, great idea. What do I need to do? We go through the thing. Six months later, they come back, and this is the old way that I practice. Six months later, they come back. Blood pressure is still 161 over 94, and their weight's the same. They're still drinking four beers every day, etc. And I'll say, well, what happened? And, well, Doc, you know, it was Thanksgiving, and the whole family was there, and boy, you know, we had a lot of great food. It was good. Then the holidays, the Christmas cookies. Well, my wife makes great Christmas cookies, and then. New Year's, you know, I did the exercise thing for about three days, and then my daughter got sick, and so I had to stay home, and then it just, it just didn't work out. And so six months later, so you would say, okay, well, do it again. You have six more months, and then you gotta do it. I'm gonna do it, Doc, I promise. Six months later, same scenario. Still have high blood pressure, haven't gotten anywhere. And so, lifestyle modification works, but they don't get the chance to, if their blood pressure is not at goal, they can start a medication, and I'll tell them, you know what? If you do these things and your blood pressure goes down, we're going to take these medicines away. And I've just stopped relying on people to do that because it's just, you, you can get trapped into believing that the next visit's going to go better. So lifestyle modification does work. I love this, this cartoon. I was able to get in one last lecture about diet and exercise. So, um, you know, if you just rely on that, you're going to have a lot of patients that end up in an intensive care. So this is what, what we tell patients. Have I got a deals for you? Deals, D is diet. So we talk to them. We get, have beautiful handouts on the DASH diet, sodium restriction. And we tell them, you know what? If you do this, you can drop your blood pressure 11 millimeters. That's, that's equivalent to one or two medications. Um, e, exercise. If you exercise 30 minutes, three times a week, we can get your blood pressure down four to seven millimeters. If you do more than that, maybe more. If you do less than that, all bets are off. A, um, let's see, A is alcohol reduction. So if you cut back on your alcohol use and drink moderately, you can lower your blood pressure two to four uh, millimeters a minute. L, lose weight. For every 10 pounds you lose weight, you can drop your blood pressure to <coughs> And S, smoking. Quit smoking, it's worth three to five points on your blood pressure. So if they do all five of the deals, they can drop their blood pressure a lot. But what percent of people actually do that? In my practice, it's a very small number. You see the one person who comes back and, yeah, I mean, I, I think, now I'm up to about two hands worth of people that I've reduced medication on. But I can tell you I've got many hands worth of people that I've never dropped their medication because this is hard to do. If it was that easy, people would be doing it left and right. So it's hard to do. But tell them you've got a deal for them. If they do this, they'll get off some of their medication. So I'm not lazy. I'm just addicted to inertia. And <laughs> clinical inertia is one of the biggest things. It, it, the, I think the first case that I went through, Jane, that's a classic case of clinical inertia. It's basically the definition is the provider doesn't change the course of action even though the patient hasn't gotten to go. And so, and why do we do that? I, I don't know why we do that. I think that one of the best, or best reasons I've heard is that 
we've got this late Wobegon effect where, you know, where it's always pleasant. So we always think the patient's going to do what we told them. Um, we think we're better than we are. I, I, illusory superiority, I think I definitely have that. When I first started disease management, I would have told you I'm, I'm phenomenal at diabetes care. When I got my first numbers, I was pretty average. I mean, I was really average, and that was a shocker to me. And it's one of the values of, of seeing the data. So clinical inertia is one of those things that we all have to fight as clinicians because, let's face it, if you look at the balance of things, it's really easy to say, oh, we'll see you back in six months. Really easy. It's a lot harder to say, we're going to start a new medication. It might have some side effects, and we're going to bring you back in two to four weeks to make sure it's working. That's hard to say. It takes more time. You have to explain your reasoning. But in your head, you have to remember, you're doing this to prevent strokes, heart attacks, and kidney failure. You just have to keep that in your head. Could you say more about the two to four weeks, please? So um, in the little algorithm that we put on the tables, which is um, our little laminated card that we use, we try to have our patients follow up in short intervals. And some clinicians have them follow up with their nurse to get up, because the only blood pressures that actually count towards your target are blood pressures that are obtained in the ambulatory setting. Patient reporting measures don't count for us, and so we need proof that the blood pressure medication is working. So we make the patient come back in two to four weeks. Rapid cycle alterations. And that's where we, I think we get the best bank. Because what tells you that this is important, that if you're a patient, more than the doctor saying, you have to come back in two to four weeks because we've got to get this under control. Or, yeah, come back in six months and we'll see how your blood pressure is doing. They send two completely different messages. Um, so we, we do rapid fire, two to four weeks, and some people do it with a, a nurse uh, algorithm, and if it's out of range, then the doc is brought in, or the, the NP is brought in to change course. Um, but I think the key is that if patients push back, my answer to them is, where do you want to be in the time? It's, it's, that, it's that simple. Jane, she's in a nursing home. Okay, do you want to spend your retirement in a nursing home? Or do you want to spend it hooked up to dialysis? Or would you rather be sitting on the beach <coughs> looking at the sunset? It's really up to you. So that's what I tell patients, and that's how I frame the equation. So there are a lot of medications out there, and um, it's sometimes it's very, very, some algorithms can get very complicated. Um, myth number two, hypertension management is complicated. It's not complicated. Um, so here's a, your next question. All of the following are reasonable choices for initial therapy of hypertension except for, pick one of these. A, angiotensin receptor blocker, B, e, calcium channel blocker, C, thiazide diuretic, D, ACE inhibitor, or E, alpha blocker. So the correct answer is E, alpha blocker. All of the others uh, in the guidelines are acceptable first-line therapy. So if you look at your algorithm, we've tried to make this as simple as possible. Um, so on that algorithm at the top, you've got essentially your blood pressure goals, and you've got what initial testing should be done, and then you've got six steps. And it's on a small pocket-sized card. It's laminated, virtually indestructible. And this was put together by our hypertension disease management uh, design team, uh, led by John Zlebeck, who's a vascular medicine physician. And we've had, you know, we, we update this whenever guidelines change. And um, I think what's beautiful about it is it's very simple and very easy. And, and I will tell you, our clinicians really buy into this. They have it in their pocket. They have it on their, usually most people have multiple copies, but they've got one at their computer desk. And so it's very, very easy. But in there, you know, very rapidly you can get people to, to target. I think there are some compelling indications for uh, starting different medications in different populations. And I think these are the three best um, arguments. So diabetic patients, obviously you should consider an ACE or an R. Um, chronic kidney disease, same thing. And then African-American patients, really either a thiazide diuretic or a calcium channel block. 
our population of African Americans in La Crosse is about seven percent, um, and it's a, so it's a very small percentage. We haven't put that on that card, but we we really could, uh, I think. And I think if someone wanted to do that and had a larger percentage, they could put that on that card pretty easily. So just to close up again, our target is if you're less than eight, our target is 140 over 90, and that's the same for our diabetic patients, chronic kidney disease patients vascular disease patients or patients with just essential hypertension. Um, and then the initial testing is there and then the steps. And so it's every two to four weeks, just rapid fire, boom, boom, boom. And very quickly you can get patients to go on. It's very easy. Last minute, blood pressure medications are expensive. Some are, but this is a list of cardiovascular drugs in the, from the $4 Walmart prescription plan. And there are a lot of great medications on here that are $4 a month or $10 for a three month supply. ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, diuretics, alpha beta blockers, um, et cetera. Calcium channel blockers are on here. So very, very inexpensive medication. So you can actually treat a diabetic or a hypertensive patient with a single drug for $10 every three months. So that's $40 a year. You can treat them with two drugs, lisinopril hydrochlorothiazide, atenolol, chlorothaladone, again, 40 bucks for the year. Three drugs, atenolol, chlorothaladone, plus lisinopril, for $80 a year. That's pretty cheap. I mean, that's a latte every other week. Pretty, pretty simple. <laughs> so, last slide. Keys to our success. Um, the number one thing I put on there, on here, that's not up there, is you need a champion. You need a champion who people trust, respect, who goes out there and says, this is how we have to do it. John Zlebeck is our hypertension champion, and he's done a great job getting by it. He goes to the small clinics, he goes to the large clinics, he teaches at their uh, primary care refresher course every year, and he preaches this message day in, day out. And if anything, it, it gives him more business as a vascular medicine physician because the people that aren't controlled on three or four drugs, they're getting referred to him. Um, number one, number two, set aspirational goals. Aim to be the best. Don't settle for second best. Well, our goals are set by who's best in our state. If you have an EMR, exploit it. You don't need it to do well with this, but if you have one, exploit it for everything it's working. <coughs> Because when we turned on some of these things, that's where we really got the most bang for our buck. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Complicated algorithms don't get followed. People find it hard to, to figure out what to do next. Make it as simple as possible. Educate clinicians to do the right thing and why they should do the right thing. We're doing this to prevent strokes, heart attacks, and kidney failure. Measure and be transparent. We're moving to a, just a clinic-wide, these are your numbers, here's how your colleagues in your clinic are doing. You're down here, talk to your colleagues about why. We've done it blinded in the past, but now we're just going full transparency. Not to the public, the public, they get our clinic-wide numbers, but in our clinics, they get um, transparency. And then maximize the value of the business. Standardize it, use your team, they can really minimize the amount of work you do. So, that's all I have.
we are actually one of the things we were at a collaborative Thursday and Friday uh, looking at diabetes disease management and some of the organizations that are doing well bring their diabetes, clinical diabetes educators into the clinic environment where so if I, my patient's not at goal I can go get that person and have them sit down with this patient and figure out why. Um, and I, we're trying to figure out the logistics of that because quite honestly we don't have enough diabetes educators to do that and that's our, our biggest gap. Um, we have them uh, centralized to the uh, endocrinology clinic where they work mostly with, uh, well, they work with all the type 1 diabetics and then only type 2 diabetics that are referred typically from primary care. Um, some organizations are going to a mandatory new diagnosis, you've got to see a diabetes educator. That's how I practice my new diabetics. I refer them um, to the diabetes educator day one. But it's a struggle only because um, sometimes we have space constraints. I mean, most of our specialists are localized and across, so we've got everybody pretty, pretty close to each other, but we have space limitations on there to put everybody that might be in a multidisciplinary clinic. But heart failure is probably our, our best example of that. And it's just essentially having them co Thank you. Can you also talk about the nurse and the pharmacist role in your multidisciplinary team? So um, on the inpatient side, all uh, rounding occurs with a pharmacist uh, with every team and with uh, a nurse. On the um, outpatient side, it's only in the design team. So um, when we decide we're going to work on, let's say we're going to put together, we just launched COPD in January. When we decided to do that, we put together a pulmonologist, a primary care provider, a pharmacist, a nurse, uh, educator, and then um, and uh, other people as needed, and put respiratory therapists, put those in the team, and they put together, figure out the guidelines. So they just work on how we set it up. They don't actually see patients in the clinic together for CFTD. I have a four part question. <laughs> okay. It was seven parts. Thank you. This is very Dr. Ertl. <laughs> <laughs> so we saw from Kaiser here that they can get to about 85% with a very integrated multidisciplinary team approach. And it seems like the 15% is patient related primarily, at least they think so. And I think that 88% for your group is just an enormous goal. And the question is, uh, so the first part is, how do you empower the patients that don't seem to want to be empowered? Um, the second part of the question is, if you have physicians that aren't performing very well, uh, you know, on maybe one or more of these, what's your approach and do you have a progressive approach towards them as far as what you do? Um, the third part of the question is, one of the reasons perhaps that GNCA went to 150 over 90 for those age 60 and above was the risk of harm and falls and other untoward events. And so do you have any, are you measuring anything that might um, be a measure of risk of harm from uh, aggressively treating or more aggressively treating hypertension? And then the last part is really, with all of what you're doing in your integrated delivery system, how much have you integrated into the part of the You're supposed to memorize all that. Okay. No, 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 it's all over that. So the first one was, um, it looks like here in, in this neighborhood, you can get to about 85% with best practices as far as controlled by <coughs> So if the others, perhaps patient related, how do you how do you empower patients, particularly those that are really disengaged, how do you pursue um, so let's talk about how, some of the things that we've done to try and improve our ability to engage the patients in it. Uh, motivational interviewing. So we had a course for our primary care providers on motivational interviewing. Um, we teach it to the medical students. So um, the WARM program in Wisconsin is the Wisconsin Academy for Rural Medicine. And it's a program where um, 30 slots in the university medical school uh, class are assigned to a rural medicine track. So once they do their two years of didactics, they spend the next two years at a regional rural site, and we are one of those sites. So we put them out into rural clinics, and we have the opportunity to actually teach them, and we're the highest rated site in the state. And so we um, get eight to 10 students per year, 
and we teach them motivational interviewing uh, as one of the techniques. So that's one thing. Um, you know, I, we were talking about it before we came out here, and one of the issues that you have is I have, and I can think of three patients off the top of my head, I have three patients that are classic white coat hypertensive. So their wife is a nurse. She measures their blood pressure at home. It is 120 over 80, or 120 over 70, or 110 over 70. And they come in the clinic, and they just smell the air in the clinic, and their blood pressure is 170 over 100 or 165 over 95. <coughs> so if you start to treat that, that's where you're going to run into the risk. I think. And, and those are the patients that, um, for a stretch, I tried treating, and I had exactly that. People complained, they were ecstatic, they didn't feel good, they passed out, etc. So um, I, those are people I just now accept. You know, I know their readings at home are accurate. They're being done by the same person who's doing it in the clinic, one floor below me. And I just have to trust that, you know, that's one of those people I'm never going to be at charge with. Um, we are not, we, we ask patients about falls as part of our standard grooming process, and, but we have not crunched the data to see if being aggressive in that 60 to 80 group. Um, where I worry about it most is probably the over 75 group. So uh, 60 to 75, I just don't see that unless there's some other reason for it. One of the most fascinating guys I have is he's, he's a Parkinson's patient and he's got orthostatic hypertension and yet when he's normal, he's got horrible hypertension. And so anything I use to treat his hypertension makes his orthostatic hypertension worse. And so you're balancing this thing. And then throw everything, you know, to throw another thing on top of it, he's got chronic kidney disease. He's basically stage four chronic kidney disease. So not controlling his blood pressure is leading to worsening the kidney failure. And, but trying to treat his blood pressure, he falls down, smashes up his face, breaks an arm, et cetera. So, uh, I mean, I'm caught in the uh, catch-22 there. So it's a, it, you know, it's a difficult, I, I think the question is still out there. Um, but we've just taken um, the approach that we're gonna go with this set of guidelines, which is AHA and ACC, and we're gonna treat those 60 to uh, 79 year olds uh, with the, and then, the, uh, what do you do with physicians that really aren't getting on so the with the program? 97% uh, of the medical staff for us is employed by the health system. 3% are not, and so um, almost every primary care, uh, every primary care specialty has quality measures built into their pain plan. So that allows the organization to target what they're going to work on. So last year it was diabetes, um, and this year it's diabetes, hypertension, um, and congestive heart failure. So we can target those things that we want to push the numbers on and build it into the pain plan. So the better they do quality-wise, the better their um, compensation for the follow -up. How much is our comfort risk? What percentage? Um, total for all of the things at risk, it's between 20 and 25 percent. So pretty high. Yeah. yeah, that's real money. 75 to 80 percent is based off of productivity, so hard in generation. Do you ever have physicians that aren't motivated by that at all and will just kind of play in their own field? Um, not really. Yeah. <laughs> not really. Um, Primary care providers are not good enough where they can really afford to ignore 20 to 25 percent of their compensation. Speaking as a so one was the pursuit of really totally disengaged patients where you know they have a failed metric from some time in the past. Their last blood pressure reading was a, but they haven't had an appointment in a while and they don't have one scheduled. Do you, so you're 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 you have a pursuit list that you're able to get to by going into that. Yeah. Is there special attention paid, paid to those that are really disengaged? Um, I'm not sure I can answer that. Um, we, I'm thinking more about diabetes because one of the things that came out of our meeting last week is I'm, I want to work on, we, every summer we get college students who uh, get compensated to be research assistants for us. And so this year, what I want to do is I'm going to get a, a summer fellow to do research on um, taking our worst controlled diabetics, those with a hemoglobin A1C greater than 
and doing interviewing to find out what are the barriers to your care. So is it is it cost? Is it transportation? Is it um, you don't believe in controlling your diabetes because we haven't given you enough data to say why it's important. But really to try and figure that out and then how do we adjust to, to make that better. We've not necessarily done it with hypertension because um, I think there's, a, I, I think you're right, I think there's about 10 to 15 percent of people who no matter what you do, you will never get them engaged in the process of controlling your blood pressure. But that means there's 85 to 90 percent of people that you can and I'll take that. So the, the last part was oh, palliative, palliative care. So um, we have uh, we have a palliative care service that uh, I started when I was the vice president over a different team that started on the inpatient side. They have now moved to the uh, ambulatory side over the last five years, and so patients can be referred to uh, palliative care. Um, we call it our next steps, which is essentially kind of people who. We're going to say today that would they be around in one to two years? Probably not. So we uh, get them into that clinic where they can go over goals of therapy, etc. And those are people who probably won't be aggressive. Now the problem is, is in the state of Wisconsin for WCHQ, they still get reported in their numbers, even though you won't necessarily be aggressive with um, their blood pressure control, and that's just a fact of life. It's just not your fuel care at the end of life. So, well, 97% of your patients or, or your uh, medical staff are employed, yep. um, and it, this wouldn't really apply to your model then. Do you have recommendations for how to better manage the care that's delivered in the small practices? So I'm guessing that given your rural environment, you do have smaller distant practices, or you're right. all together? They're all linked. Yeah. They're linked. Yeah. They're all linked. I mean, there, there are, so Winona Health, uh, Crone Clinic, there are little pockets of independent practitioners around us that are actually providers in that work for the Gunderson Health Plan. Okay. So one of the things you would ask me is, how does your, how do your internal numbers compare with the external providers in the insurance network? And um, the, Gunderson Health Plan has never actually crunched those numbers to see what they look like because um, technically we can't, we're not supposed to be able to see them. But I'm getting, I actually asked them to run and they are going to run it when they run their numbers this spring. And then we'll be able to <coughs> we'll look at any specific clinics that are non Gunderson clinics, but we'll look at the entire base of non Gunderson providers. Are they, uh, do you host Epic for them? We do not. So some of them are on alternative EMRs like Cerner, um, and we do like for our regional sites with four critical access hospitals, we post Epic for them and for the clinics that they have associated with them. But no, none of the non gunnerson facilities uh, have Epic through us. So talk to Jose about that. I think that's one of the things. Yeah. Mayor? Uh, just a quick question. What do you do with the specialists? Since you rely on, on the blood pressure that's the most recent in your EMR, right? And if the specialist saw that patient with the blood pressure that's high, what do you do? So um, blood pressures that are not included are urgent care, ER, and then a surgical procedure uh, visits. So if someone comes in to have their cataract done, those don't actually get reported uh, as the last blood pressure. But if the patient goes to the podiatry clinic, then those kind of and it's one of the complaints that our primary care providers have is that we currently don't have a system that tells them or notifies them that, hey, your patient's blood pressure was out of range. Uh, and that's something we're working on. Now, we actually look to see what percentage of patients out of range that accounts for. It's 1%. Okay. So we could do a lot of work to build a system that would really only address 1%. And if someone just did the radar dashboard and looked at their list, they would actually be able to see that patient was out of range and then go back and see where, where that blood pressure Wonderful teacher, thank you. Excellent presentation. We appreciate you coming all the way out here. It was really worth it for us. So.
Thank you. And as uh, many of you know, I'm, I'm Jose Alberto. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm a medical director for uh, Sutter Independent Physicians. And I'm one of the co-directors, and I wanted to. Uh, I know we have a, a, a little limited time, but I wanted to kind of update you a little bit on some of the work we're doing. We still are very interested in any of the other organizations or physician organizations who would like to participate uh, in the uh, survey that uh, Dr. Ertl uh, produced uh, for Mercy Medical Group that we're now uh, in the process of working uh, with uh, our independents. And we're happy to, to uh, mention that we're, uh, Southern Independent Physicians is working with health physicians now to try to um, uh, um, bring the survey up since we share a lot of the same doctors and uh, and we believe that it's going to be very useful information for us as we survey those doctors. So I'm really excited about another collaboration that we're going to have with Hill. Uh, I think it's a great way to go. So thank you, Doug. Um, the uh, other thing that, as you know, that we've been trying to do is to now move forward with uh, you know our first product for Right Care. Uh, we've been, we've been coming and, and talking about these great presentations and learning from experts across the country, uh, hoping that uh, you know this is, this information will spread. I think for the first time now we're going to produce a, a product out of Right Care, and we're producing uh, what we believe is a, 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 going to be a helpful tool, uh, and that's guidelines uh, uh, for hypertension management. And just as you've seen that Gunderson has their guidelines, we believe that it's going to be very useful, not so much for everyone. We don't believe that this is, uh, you know, this is not standards of care, as we mentioned. We're not saying to people, this is what you need to do within the Sacramento region. But we know that there's a lot of physicians and organizations that um, don't have the opportunity to have a so-called so guiding light uh, to help them. And we know that Sutter, we have uh, 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 guidelines. Uh, and we know that Mercy has hypertension guidelines, but there's also a lot of providers out in the community who don't have the benefit of saying, and as, as uh, uh, I think Dr. Dolan mentioned, there's a set of competing guidelines out there. And there, so we believe that it's going to be very helpful for us to create something that uh, will be our first tool. Uh, by the way, this is not, we hope this is not the end of the tools that we're going to be presenting uh, as right care. But uh, to really create something that uh, uh, physicians can look at and, and other providers and say, you know, this was uh, supported by Right Care Initiative. And again, these are guidelines. They can accept them, reject them. They can take parts of them. They can take the whole thing. We, we, we believe that it's going to be very helpful uh, to us to uh, produce it. In your packet is a, and it's not really labeled, it's, but it's labeled as uh, the uh, uh, JC8 Hypertension Guidelines 2014. Well, I think we're going to really try to label it a little different, and that's uh, the clinicians in, within uh, uh, the Right Care Initiative of the Capital Region, and then subtitle it uh, uh, coming from JC8. Um, and, uh, and I think we're going to title it 2015 because it's a product that's coming out of 2015. And, and, uh, and uh, there, this is just, it doesn't say draft, but it is a draft. And we'd like for you to take this home and, uh, and really give us your recommendations if you think this uh, uh, makes sense to you. Again, this is coming from JC8, but I'm going to turn it over to Susan, because uh, I don't really have to introduce Susan. Everybody pretty much knows Susan Ivey. Uh, she's a professor at the University of California, Berkeley School of Public Health and Director of Research at Health Research for Action, which is a UC Berkeley affiliated research center. And she's a teacher there at the Joint Medical Program. In addition, she's also the Assistant Medical Director for the City of Berkeley Division of Public Health. She's a family physician with a Master's in Health Services Management and Policy. And she's also completed a two-year postdoctoral research fellowship at the Health Policy and Health Services Research at UC Berkeley. And Dr. Ivey has uh, been helping us uh, since we began Right Care. And uh, you know, I, I, like I say, it doesn't really need this introduction. But uh, she's really the, the, the key person, the key clinician who's been helping us put the, these, uh, um, um, what we call capital region, JC, uh, JC, JNC8 uh, guidelines together. So she's going to really um, talk to us about how this is, is working. And uh, hopefully, we'll get your feedback to create a, 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 our first product. She's bringing that up. I, I thought it was just strikingly interesting that um, 
Dr. Dolan, first of all, appears with a card, and I'm like, darn, you know, we got to get from here to something like this. So that's, you know, the kind of tool. The other thing is that I will also admit that my grandfather was a tobacco farm. So, <laughs> small world. My mother was also a heavy duty tobacco smoker for a long time, which is another piece of uh, coming from a tobacco family. And my grandmother passed away this past summer at 103 years of age. So we've listened to a real expert and um, working on uh, hypertension and a practicing uh, internist who really um, does this every day. And I'm going to come at it from the opposite perspective. I really want to get input from you guys about what you think would be helpful tools in your um, practices. Um, I do still practice. I, I'm a, a one day a week clinical time with the city of Berkeley. I also manage um, two sites for them, which is a, a adolescent clinic that's at the high school and an adult clinic that's um, run by the city also. So um, I have had to go through some of these um, painful experiences um, of being measured and not liking your measures and trying to improve those even if my topic uh, is not necessarily right. Is, that, is it going on? It's on. Okay. It's on. You right. just have to keep it right. close. So, the first thing I want to come back to is what are some of the steps that we can um, look at that work to bring research to change in physician behavior. So we know that there's the, the development of research and that's not what we're talking about here. Um, plenty of new research studies, um, those are also digested by a variety of organizations like JNCA did, like US Preventive Services Task Force, like the Cochrane Reviews. So that's people looking at evidence, grading the evidence, and then developing a guideline. So then we're to this next step where um, we got to, with, you know, end of 2013 with new JNCA um, guidelines. And then the steps that come after that usually are approval of those guidelines by credible associations. Um, in this case, as Dr. Dolan has, has referred to, is there's a lot of um, you know, argument among the different types of professions about fully adopting JNC-8. So I'm not going to get a lot into that except where there are some specific controversies. And then this red place is kind of where I see us are, to, where we are today. Physician behavior change. How can we actually actionalize the, the physician making this kind of change in their um, prescribing behavior and the way that they interface with their um, hypertensives and the frequency at which they bring people back for visits. And we're hoping that that will translate into uh, the better patient outcomes and we can measure this in a variety of ways. So active methods of getting physicians engaged are more effective. Uh, continuing education like we do here, but also going out to sites via academic uh, detailing, doing outreach. Um, what I used to call train the trainers, where you train an internal group of physicians to then go out and do um, training with other physicians. We use that a lot to, uh, when we first started bringing out guidelines for women in heart disease, American Medical Women's Association. So, can you hear me? Yep. Just start shouting. It's, you can go like this if it's not loud enough. Um, will it conflict? Um, and then uh, some of the other things we've done, which is create small group learning communities where learners interact with other learners, and I think that's kind of what we have here with our University of Best Practice. We have the opportunity to, um, you know, talk with each other and to discuss with experts um, that come visit us from all different places, and uh, to do little test experiments like what um, Bill Simon did when he looked at his group of hypertensives and did some special strategies that he thought would work within his population, which interestingly uh, is also a lot of bomb in his practice too. And then he comes back and talks to us about what works. The second step that we've really tried to do is to groom these local opinion leaders. Um, these are not always uh, the leaders like uh, Dr. Dolan was talking about within an organization, but influentials who can say they're adopting those specific guidelines and then allow their colleagues to see what the results of those actions are. Um, the other two I'm not really going to talk about today, but the other ones that work with physicians are patient-mediated intervention, where patients get feedback to physicians, and multifaceted interventions, where we're combining multiple approaches 
based on guidelines, based on what your individual budget is, your organization, what your specific practice needs are, using pharmacists, using health coaches, teams, and the team, things like that. So JNCA, um, uh, we've heard a little bit about the controversy. Um, JNC 7 is the last guideline we had from the federal government. JNC 8 was commissioned by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. It was a 17-member panel. Um, by the end of the process, which actually took almost 10 years from JNC 7, um, there was a lot of infighting within the team. Um, NHLBI was ready to like hand this off to somebody else, and we got some guidelines. But I think it's important to know that there are three questions that they were focused on, and they used a systematic review just of randomized controlled trials that met specific criteria, and these are the three questions. In adults with hypertension, does initiating medication therapy at specific blood pressure thresholds improve health outcomes? The next one was, in adults with hypertension, does treatment with various medications lead to specific improvements in outcomes? And then in adults with hypertension, do various drug classes differ in terms of their comparative benefits and harms for specific outcomes? So for those, they use this um, you know, very systematic literature review like Cochrane uses and went through a lot of the um, evidence and graded it. They came up with this algorithm, which we're kind of adopting, with some changes that I'd like to sort of check in with you guys about and also get your input on other things. So this is the one that would be in the JNC you know, guideline as you get it. It has the differential between the age groups, um, has the blood pressure goal for, for the older age, and it's hard for me to say older because I'm 60 now, so. But anyway, those folks, systolic blood pressure being less than 150, and then for the uh, younger folks, systolic blood pressure less than 140. In addition, they differentiated, differentiated these other categories of patients who have diabetes but don't have chronic kidney disease and people who have chronic kidney disease um, with or without diabetes and separate uh, parts of the algorithm for this. And then down at the bottom, uh, what we didn't see in the Gunderson one but I think is important for our populations here is differentiating between black and non-black in terms of order that you might go in for the, the medication. Um, and then a box that's talking about maximizing your first medication before adding a second or bringing on a second medication before reaching the maximum dose. So we'd like to use this as sort of a baseline for producing the little um, small tool that we'll come up with. Um, we want to uh, brand it as um, Jose's talked about as clinicians in the um, capital region right care. I think we do uh, agree, and Mary and Jose have already weighed in, that we probably need to say something about home blood pressure monitoring. We know there's a lot of evidence now that shows that patients who do home blood pressure monitoring are more likely to be in control. And then the second part is these repetitive loops, um, which I think what we are seeing now really needs is in the red over here, is we need to say how frequent these loops are occurring. So every two to four weeks is recommendation nine and the JNC eight. Um, but these are basically iterative um, places where you would reassess um, how the patient's doing. If they're not in control, you're reinforcing medication adherence, lifestyle adherence, thinking about what your next class of uh, medication would be, and then titrating doses of your medications to try and get better. So multiple organizations have now endorsed these guidelines. We're not going out in a new direction, and we were very specific about not wanting to kind of go off in our own direction. We don't want to set policy for practices. We want to gather information and get input from you guys about kind of tools that could help physicians do better. And specifically, I want to point out the disagreement on the blood pressure levels for initiation of treatment among adults over age 60. So um, MGMA measure up pressure down, which we've heard a lot about too. They did not adopt those guidelines as um, our Gunderson representative said, they did not um, adopt those guidelines. And there is some evidence now to show that um, with at least some studies, there is um, very good evidence to show that this um, is probably not gonna be more widely adopted because we'll get new information that'll disprove um, the other evidence. Always when you look at differences in evidence, I like to think about you know, what they did. So one, JNC8, they just looked at randomized controlled trials. JNC7 used observational studies as well. Um, the other is that they, what the real controversy was is there was no study that had a significant enough sample size of individuals who were over 60 who had had their blood pressure controlled to under 140 
for them to be able to feel like they could grade that is what we like to call grade eight evidence. So that's why the, the secondary opinion was, you know, insufficient evidence because there wasn't a good study that they could put their pin their hat on. But the invest study by um, Bangalore that came out in 2014 is very interesting because they demarcated, they're all over 60 that are in that study. They demarcated ones who had their blood pressure controlled at under 140, at under 150, and at under 160. And there was a clear gradation of uh, decreased cardiovascular uh, mortality, all-cause mortality, and stroke incidence in the groups that were under 140. So I think we're going to develop the stronger evidence that was missing at the time of the um, ongoing arguments in JNC8. And then the other thing we'd like to, to mirror with this is this is really focusing on medication treatment. And we want to do that. We want to get our physicians to do that. But the flip side of the little thing there is what would be the other things that a physician might like to have handy to reinforce um, lifestyle change, to uh, look at some of these things that we might not all have been trained to do, like the DASH diet, what's in the DASH diet. And then what I think is interesting that Denison has included is what's some of the workup that you want your physicians to be doing, either at the beginning or during these rapid cycles that are going on. So we're hoping this would kind of be on the flip side, so this is on the back of the one that you're looking at. Um, these are a little bit different ranges than, than the ones that we got from Dr. Dolan, but I just used this from a, a journal article. You know, we can run the evidence if we feel like there's you know some disagreement on these, but basically weight reduction, the DASH diet, lowering sodium intake, uh, physical activity, and uh, moderation of alcohol consumption. And as Gunderson's already done, they did add tobacco cessation here at the bottom, and um, Mary uh, has, is also reminding us we want to make sure that tobacco cessation reminder is front and center when you're um, talking to your patients who are still smoking. And then, because a lot of us don't know what DASH is, we just know it's hard to follow. Um, but anyway, this is what DASH is. This is what was tested. And there's a separate uh, diet called DASH sodium, which has even lower sodium than 1,500 milligrams. And my experience as a clinician is that, um, particularly for my African American patients, they don't like this diet. It doesn't taste good to them. And so coming up with other diets that are more acceptable across different cultural groups, I think it's going to be really important. And we're going to continue to look a little bit into that um, dietary information. And then in terms of uh, lab evaluation, again, just this is just meant to be a little reminder piece for um, the clinicians in terms of what their baseline uh, workup might be. And as you can see in the um, uh, Gunderson one, he has additional um, monitoring of potassium and, and uh, uh, creatinine at these uh, visits when you're using medications that might cause differences in that. So that's another thing we, want, we might want to consider. So next I just want to really get back from you. Will, do we think the physicians in this area will use a reminder sheet? Would they rather have something that's embedded in an EHR that's a decision support tool like um, EPIC um, can have? Would they prefer apps? We know that uh, ACC has a clinical guideline app. It doesn't have the blood pressure management in it, in it now, but we could certainly uh, lobby some of our other colleagues to add that to the app. Some kind of online website support, which again, you guys are already doing. The physicians can flip from Gunderson's intranet page to their EHR and go back and forth to look at guidelines if they need those. Um, and then this, this outreach and detailing that we've talked about doing, do we want to um, come up with a, a group, an internal group, who acts as the trainers and goes out to practices to do some training that way, um, external academic detailing? And do we want to really promote that we have leaders within um, Right Care who are adopting the guideline and talking about how it changed their numbers? So that's another strategy that's been shown to and then just what are the other ideas you have? So I really want to open it up and let you guys kind of talk about what you think will be useful. Um, we're, we're all about producing tools that people will actually use, so we don't want to put together something that people will just put in the drawer and not use. The thing I love about this is that it's very pocket size, and so it can fit in you know, a pocket. It could be a, a bifold if we want to have the lifestyle things there and still be small like this. 
Um, and then what I have for my nurse practitioners, we actually do have different STD guidelines from CDC and from the state of California. So we have little laminated sheets that are actually up on their boards at both sides so that they can, you know, kind of look there quickly. Um, our EHR is not as sophisticated as so if we have next gen. Um, it doesn't have any decision making stuff in it really. I think it has a reminder to do tobacco cessation counseling. The person, if you check the smoking box and it calculates BMI, but it's a very um, primitive compared to other types of. <coughs> And talk about your experience and if you have tools you use. I see and Jessica. And then I think I Dr. Erdl has a question. I just wanted to see if there's any research being done on compromises, compromise approach. Like, for example, um, tell your patient So I think those are really, really important. I have a medical student who just did her um, master's thesis on a Bollywood dance intervention for women with diabetes, which was showed statistically significant decreases in hemoglobin A1C. So I think these types of things, both diet and exercise, are really going to have to be pretty culturally nuanced for people to um, uptake. When I did the study on cardiovascular health in Asian Indians, most of the women said, I don't exercise. But then when we asked how much they walked, they said, oh, you know, I take the baby for stroller every day. I go to the park. How far is the park? A mile. So obviously they are getting physical activity in, but they might not use the same language we use. So we have to try to figure out what are the words they use, what are the things that are possible within the context of their life. You can't tell a patient to go out and, you know, be physically active in their neighborhood if their neighborhood's not safe. So I think we have to really be very cognizant of that with our patients. And then I'm all about you know, harm reduction. So if somebody says to me, um, I'm not gonna take the beta blocker because it gives me erectile dysfunction, I'm gonna give them a different medication because they're gonna go home and not take the medication if they have side effects that they really perceive as not being tolerable. And I think, you know, as you said, reminding them over and over and over again that your, your goal is good. Your goal is to keep them healthy. Your goal is to prevent um, heart attack and stroke. But within their world, what are the small changes, the baby steps that they can make for that? The, the, the second thing, I really want to encourage this size. Yes, I love this. When I came in, I stole it off of, Don was back there, and I stole his, because I didn't know if I would get one or not. Uh, we uh, focus on farm workers. Mm -hmm. And uh, for the longest time, uh, wanted to see them having something with their rights, workers' rights. Exactly. Yeah. So we did a, a pocket-sized calendar with the most important rights for a worker, and they carry them in their pocket. And uh, it, we've done so good with, uh, with that that we can introduce those in evidence in court, and um, and they're accepted, right. and they have their the reference right there, mm -hmm. you know, they just take it out of their pocket. Mm -hmm. So this size works in many ways. So I think there'll be a parallel process after they get through the, the clinical team process to create something that's going to work, whatever yeah. that is, yeah. 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 to do the patient yeah. side, and that will be, you know, with you and the chronic care coalition, et cetera. But Dr. Erdl had a And question. Jessica had a comment. And by the <laughs> Yeah, well, we may not need it for the physicians, but definitely for the patients, yes. at least bilingual, yes. So, competing. So, Jessica, did you have So, any? my comment was that one of the things that uh, I think Dr. Golan said was, we trained everybody up in how to do this correctly. And I think that without going out and having a best practice university and have people 
to train the MAs and train the others on how to do an accurate blood pressure measurement, um, a lot of this is going to be for naught. And so just going to the physicians isn't going to be enough. But if you empower the MAs to say, this is a high blood pressure reading and you did it right, there, I think that your likelihood of bringing that to the physician's attention is much higher. The other is that people like feedback and without an EMR, you know, there are some registry functions that you can get to say, well, even if you really don't have an EMR or your EMR is hard to get data out of, you can still use these registry functions and see how your population is doing. And so those will be two things as far as your, your simple tools that might be Worthwhile right, right. Um, and I think the other thing on that is that we all know we're being measured and a lot of us are producing some set of measures to report on. And so we have to assume for some people they're already reporting on this if we can build on the fact that maybe their, lower, their numbers are lower and how can we raise those um, for the small practices might be able to do. Or it's giving me the one minute. Are there any other specific additions? Or I really want to encourage you, you can write on this, you can mail it to us, you can drop it on the table up front, um, you can email me or, or Hattie. Or and you uh, and I just like to say real quick in the last 30 seconds before everybody group. picks up, um, is I agree with the uh, tools series here, but what I want to say is I think if you do anything as a group, what we need to do is um, be clear on the physician role and then other partners and their role. Uh, so for instance, you come with a knowledge of public health and the role there. We've heard from community groups. I mean, I think the physician, as well as was described today, he also, in Wisconsin, described an environment of health. You've described a lot of upstream, kind of out of the doctor's office environments that I don't think should be for our physician leaders their concern necessarily. They need to be moved into the people working in that space like public health. And the other team I'm hoping at a later time to bring to the group is the thought of using pharmacists to help with some of these um, very extreme uh, need patients. Um, we have some models coming up, and I, I want to bring that as part of the toolkit, but again, in the environment of we all have our best practice, let's do that integrated team approach and have each group bring what they can to support our physician leaders. And that is a really good segue to mention that next month, on April 13th, we're going to have a program on advances in community pharmacy-based medication therapy management to help with these issues. Um, so I want to encourage all the clinical people in the room to please uh, uh, do your continuing education forms. Um, and I want to thank the Health Services Advisory Group for making the continuing education possible. The only way they can continue to do the work to give you that free continuing education credit is if you go and do and just fill this out so that you get your credit. Um, I also want to thank our uh, our sponsors, the Sierra Health Foundation, for hosting us here today. The California Chronic Care Coalition is our long-term partner. The Health Services Advisory Group a federal quality improvement organization, and particularly want to call out Beringer, Ingelheim, and Nova Nordis for their uh, support for Right Care. And um, with that, I want to just encourage you all to join uh, the physicians and nurses, in particular the pharmacists, to join Dr. Ivy, Dr. Firmus, and Dr. Revelo in the development of these practical tools that are going to allow us to get to the level of performance that Gunderson has through, through using practical tools. And thank you, uh, My Vitals, for helping Dr. Gunderson uh, get to us. It was a wonderful happenstance that we got to have one of the top performers in the nation with us today. So thanks again. Thank you.